Today we celebrate liberty, which is without question the main theme of our country's conception. You see this in the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. After winning independence from England, the United States Constitution was composed, and it begins with this preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Nearly a century later, the fabric of our country was nearly shredded in the Civil War. Yet in the midst of that conflict, President Abraham Lincoln reminded America of her beginnings in his famous Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. There are the famous four freedoms first proclaimed by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1941, where he spoke of freedom of speech everywhere, freedom of worship everywhere, freedom from want everywhere, and freedom from fear everywhere. But I wonder, are we truly free? There's something all of us want to be, need to be, ought to be, but only a few really are. Even though we think it's good, even though we say it's right, even though we love its benefits and we defend its value, though it's ours to claim, we don't. Though it's available to enjoy, we won't. It's biblically supported. It's theologically sound. It's commanded by God. It's desired by man. But rare is the Christian who enters into it in full enthusiasm. What is it? Freedom. All of us want to be free. We need to be free. We ought to be free. And yet, millions of Americans live in slavery. All right, I know we don't like that word, so let's call it addiction. Consider these sobering facts. Fourteen and a half million Americans today, age 12 and older, are alcoholics. Fifty-three million, or 19 percent of people 12 or over, have used illegal drugs or misused prescription drugs in the last year. According to recent research, five million adults in America meet the criteria for compulsive gambling. Forty million Americans regularly visit porn sites on the Internet. Addictions come in all shapes and sizes. And it seems like most people have at least one, sometimes more than one. So why are so few free? Experts will try to identify environmental factors, hereditary issues, physiological, psychological, emotional reasons, but the Bible states that the problem is spiritual. Jesus said in John 8, 34, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And how many people sin? All of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Say, yeah, but that doesn't apply to Christians, right? <clears throat> well, how many Christians do you know that would characterize their living as in liberty? that they are truly free. Would you include yourself in that number? Or does your experience echo Paul's in Romans 7, beginning in verse 14? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, and I cannot carry it out. 
For if I do the good I do not, or if I do, yeah, if what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So I find that in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work for the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. Thank you. And making me a prisoner of the law at sin work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Does that sound familiar? Does that feel familiar? A lot of us have been there at one time or another. Perhaps we're there ourselves. Now this might sound futile. This might sound hopeless. But thankfully the scriptures do not leave us there. The same man who wrote the above testimony also wrote much about the liberty, the freedom that we have as Christians. And among Paul's writings, indeed of all the books of the Bible, none addresses the topic of freedom more than his letter to the Galatians. It's a letter that is sometimes called the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. The word liberty appears in different forms about ten times in that brief letter to the Galatians. This morning I'd like to focus on Galatians chapter 5. The theme is set in verse 1 when it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then we see it bookended in verse 13, You, my brothers, were called to be free. And in the verses in between, Paul tells us how to live in freedom, how to avoid the traps that can steal our liberty if we're not careful. Paul addresses first the extreme of legalism. And he says, in Christ we have freedom from the slavery of legalism. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You are fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we have hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Thank you. Paul warns the Galatians, you are free in Christ. Don't be bound and enslaved by legalism. You know, in this context, there were Jews who uh, were really pushing circumcision. They're saying, it's nice you believe in Christ, but if you really want uh, to be God's children, you must be circumcised as well. And really what this points to is, is a common division that we always see between religion that tells us what we need to do, and Christianity, which tells us what has already been done. Religion says do. Christianity says done. When Christ died on the cross, he said it is finished. The work is done. And we can't add anything to that. Paul makes it very clear in verse 4, there's no mixing of the two. The New Century Version reads, If you try to be made right with God through the law, your life with Christ is over. You've left God's grace. But instead, we live by grace through faith. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, It is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works. Nothing we can do can put us right with God. Most of us, if not all, would agree that that's true when it comes to our salvation. We cannot work our way to heaven. Nothing we can do can save us. But what about the way we live our lives after salvation? I really think that's where we see legalism most in the church today. Legalism believes that every act, every habit, every type of behavior is either black or white. Legalism lives by rules rather than by the Spirit. They classify everything as Black or white, whether the Bible does or not. 
They develop exhaustive lists of do's and don'ts. Doing the things on the good list, avoiding the things on the bad list is their idea of spirituality, no matter what the inner person is like. Their lives are law-controlled, not spirit-controlled. But refraining from doing things is not spirituality. That is not how we measure our growth in Christ. Walking in the Spirit, that's what spirituality is all about. Legalism stifles liberty. It stifles conscience. It stifles the Word of God. It actually stifles the Holy Spirit. And Paul warned these young Christians against legalism. Legalist says, if you're a Christian, you'll listen to this certain kind of music. You'll dress this certain way. You'll only wear your hair this way. You'll only read this translation of the Bible. And the list goes on and on. Now, what's the driving force behind legalism? It's the old familiar foe. Legalism is an attitude that is primarily based on pride. It's an obsessive conformity to an artificial standard for the purpose of exalting oneself. It's really all about me, not even about God. Legalists ascribe to this little ditty, Believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else confess. Feel as I feel, think as I think, eat what I eat, drink what I drink. Look as I look, do always as I do, then and only then I'll have fellowship with you. And yet we have churches, we have individuals who live by that motto. Only if you agree with me. We're seeing that in our culture, aren't we? There's no room for a variation of thought or opinion, is there? If you don't agree with way the narrative is being presented, then you're just wrong. And you're an opponent to be defeated. But how often do we see this in the church as well? We are freed by faith. And we must continue to live by faith if we're really going to be free. On the opposite side of legalism is another extreme called license. And Jesus gives us freedom from the shackles of license. Look down to verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. That's the other extreme we can go to. Oh, I'm free. I'm free from the law. Some have reworded that old hymn, free from the law, oh, happy condition, sin all I want and still have permission. (laughs) That's not how it was written. And that's not the truth of God's word. Again, like another version of this, the contemporary English reads, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want. That hits close to home, doesn't it? (laughs) I'm free, I'm forgiven, so I can indulge. Paul says, no, watch out. That's a trap. You can be just as easily enslaved and shackled by license to sin as you can legalism. John Stott writes, Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. It's an unrestricted liberty of approach to God as his children, not an unrestricted liberty to wallow in our own selfishness. Now, let's admit it. Sin's enjoyable, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be tempting. You ever notice how all the food that's bad for you tastes really good? And all that stuff that's supposed to be so good for you, ugh. You can't hardly stand it? I don't think that's coincidence. But also, we have to admit that while sin is enjoyable, it's also enslaving. We just have an addictive personality. It's just part of our fallen nature. And we can become just as miserable as Paul described himself in Romans 7. He said, I can't help it. I've tried so many times to kick that habit And I keep falling back into it again. Doesn't that sound like Romans 7? He ends the chapter, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? And there are people all over our nation today, this land of liberty, that are saying just that. Rescue me! Help me! I can't help myself. 
And yet Paul goes right on to answer his own question. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There really is victory in Jesus. There really is freedom and liberty in Jesus Christ. Into the very next chapter, and remember when Paul wrote Romans in any of his letters, they didn't have chapters and verses. The flow continues. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. We have freedom. Freedom from what? The law of sin and death. The very things Paul was writing about in Romans 7. And how is that achieved? Through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God who lives within every believer. And the rest of Romans 8 speaks of life in the Spirit, life of freedom, life of liberty. We read in 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Did you catch that? Everything we need. We have at our disposal. That tells me that the Christian can never say, I can't help it. We can never use the excuse, oh, I can't help myself. The Bible says you can through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. We can be free. You say, well, how do I do that practically speaking? At the risk of sounding overly simplistic, I say the key is to accept responsibility for your actions and addictions. Reject this modern mantra that says you're a victim. You can't help it. You have a disease. What I've discovered about habits is that bad habits are made by decisions. We make choices, and choices become habits. You know how you break habits? The very same way. It's the choices we make. We fall into bad habits by making bad choices. You break bad habits by making good choices. And I believe it's very important if you're going to try to kick an an addiction, a habit, you need to replace it with something good. That's something the New Testament teaches over and over. So take responsibility. And in the power of the Spirit of God, say, I am going to make the right choice. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need help. We don't need support. I'm not saying we may not need medical assistance. If it's there, use it. But quit using the excuse that you're a victim. You are not. You are a victor in Jesus Christ. We have the victory in Him, and the Spirit of God living in us gives us everything we need for life and godliness. We can live in freedom. The only one who can overcome the power of sin is the Holy Spirit, but the good news is he lives within you, and he gives you that ability. Now, most often, freedom is spoken in terms of freedom from certain things. We've been talking about that, freedom from legalism, freedom from license to sin. But I want to conclude with the freedom for serving one another in love. Remember, verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Another translation says, Christ has freed us so that we may enjoy the benefits of freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. You mean we're supposed to enjoy the Christian life? That doesn't sound right. Well, of course we are. Jesus said, I have come that we may have life, that we may have it more abundantly. He said, If You abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Obviously, this idea of freedom and liberty is quite important to God. So how do we keep ourselves from the extremes of legalism on one side and license on the other? The answer is given to us here in verses 6 and 13, love. Serve one another in love. When we love others, we don't intentionally do things that hurt them or displease them. And the same is true with God. While the legalist tries in vain to keep the law as his way into heaven, 
the liberated Christian fulfills the law by loving God and loving one another. It's really that simple. It's not a big, long list of do's and don'ts. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus said the whole law is summarized right there. Paul says that love fulfills the law. Love one another. That's what it takes. We are to serve one another in love. In conclusion, I I must admit, I am frankly amazed and alarmed at how many Americans are so quickly giving up their liberty. And it's happening all around us. It's happening as a nation. We are allowing the liberties we've always enjoyed to slip away. But what's even more tragic than that is how Christians fail to live in liberty. Christ has freed us from the penalty of sin, and yet how many of us are still struggling with the power of sin? And yet the Holy Spirit has been given to us for that very reason, to break the power of sin. We find ourselves slipping either into legalism on one extreme or license on the other, instead of living in the liberty that Christ intended. And so I want to challenge you this morning. Let us commit ourselves to the defense of liberty, not only as Americans, but as Christians. Let us learn and let us live in liberty, in the power of God's Holy Spirit, so that we are not enslaved to sin, nor are we enslaved to legalism. We live in love. We live in liberty. Let us live in the freedom for which Christ sets us free. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the liberty we have in Jesus Christ. Not only as a guarantee that one day we will live with you in eternity, but freedom right here and now. Freedom from sin. Freedom to serve. Freedom to love. Freedom to live life abundantly, even as you have promised. So I pray that as Americans and as Christians, we would fully appreciate this gift of liberty we've been given. May we live in it. May we love others and love you and show what freedom is really all about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.